Welcome back to Untested Arcana, the show where I take fictional characters and popular media and use them to make tabletop RPG content. As the name suggests, the show isn't about making perfect things that are ready to be published right away. It's about the kinds of design decisions that go into making that first draft that you bring to the table, bring to your DM to, you know, see if it works. Today's episode is kind of uh, interesting for me. I had the idea for this channel, I mean, over two years ago, and I, I really procrastinated on starting it. And I had a couple of things designed, a couple of scripts written, and I just kind of didn't get around to actually producing any videos. And last year, I gave myself a deadline. I was going to make a Doctor Strange video in time for Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Obviously, that did not happen. But now that I've sort of found my rhythm, figured out how to make these videos, uh, I think it's time to, uh, to bring that design to YouTube. So Doctor Strange presents an interesting conundrum for, like, subclass design. He is very plainly a wizard. I don't think there's any need for us to discuss what class he is. In some ways, there isn't a need to make a custom subclass for Doctor Strange if you really want to get the play experience of being master of the mystic arts. I mean, that's just what a wizard is. So we have to look and try to identify the things that he does on screen, on the page, that maybe can't be done with existing spells or existing subclasses. And to me, that's like three very specific powers. One is the sling ring. Uh, this use of portals is a little bit hard to recreate with existing teleportation spells. In that same vein, the mirror dimension is very present in Doctor Strange's magic and frankly, all of the sort of sorcerers in Marvel. I mean, Plane Shift exists, but that kind of banishing people there, that is possible, but maybe not so easy to do as freely as they do it in like the Avengers. And then lastly, and this one's maybe kind of small, it's the little orange constructs, the discs, the whips, even the blades that initially in the first movie are just summoned by the bad guys, but later you do see Strange and Wong making like orange blade constructs. And that kind of moves into the, the last thing. There's a vaguely martial arts flavor to the way that the sorcerers train in Marvel. They seem to kind of wear like leather armor. They seem to practice with weapons. And this made me realize that like, the Doctor Strange subclass isn't a Doctor Strange subclass. It's a Camertage subclass. This subclass should be based thematically around the Mirror Dimension. Now, we can't call it the Mirror Dimension. I'm going to give it a new, I think, fun name. And all the powers should be thematically linked to that dimension. So it is an order of wizards who draw power from this new plane of existence and all their powers flow from it and somehow make sense because of that. So I took all of that and I made this draft of an arcane tradition called Order of the Fractal Plain. Training deep in the mountains of a far off land, the Order of the Fractal Plain is a secretive group of wizard warriors pledged for life to protecting the multiverse. They draw their magic from a unique plane of existence known as the Fractal Plain, a chaotic layer that sits atop the material plane, mirroring and distorting it like an arcane kaleidoscope. A practitioner of this unique magic can not only pull fragments of this power into our plane, but may also learn how to travel freely into and through it, reshaping the battlefield to protect their allies and confuse their foes. So I, I mentioned this last week, but um, always fascinated by alternate groupings for subclass names. Last week we did Chorus of the Accursed instead of College of something for a bard. Now, I made up Chorus of. There aren't really alternate names for bard colleges. Wizard actually has two established alternate names. There is Blank Magic, War Magic, Chronogy Magic, and then there's the Order of Scribes. And so I felt like this isn't a school. This is an order. It has that sense that you have to be invited, that they train together in a very specific way. All the features they're going to get are going to link back to this description and make sense in context. Starting with combat training. You gain proficiency with light armor and simple weapons. In addition, your hit point maximum increases by two and increases by one again whenever you gain a level in this class. I basically stole this from kind of bladesingers, but also kind of draconic sorcerers. 
Proficiency with light armor is just a way to avoid having to cast mage armor as much, and I think, again, like, thematically it makes sense. Simple weapons kind of doesn't matter. In my mind, what it might accomplish is making a few more magic weapons accessible to you, because the bank of weapons that you are proficient with is a little bigger now. The hit point maximum thing, I mean, I think it's kind of meaningless. Going from functionally a d6 hit die to a d8 hit die isn't going to radically alter how much combat you can participate in. Again, that's mostly there for flavor. You are just a little tougher, slightly more martial than most wizards. After this, we get the big feature. Fractal Shards. Starting at second level, you can conjure fragments of the fractal plane to aid in combat. As a bonus action, you create up to two fractal shards, one in each empty hand. A hand that is holding a shard is considered occupied, and you can use a shard as a spellcasting focus for your wizard spells. Each shard can take the form of one of three weapons detailed below. When you attack with a shard, you use your intelligence modifier for the attack and damage rolls. No matter what form it takes, the shard dissipates after one minute, or if you dismiss it, no action required. Splinter. The shard hardens into a jagged, translucent blade. The splinter deals 1d10 piercing damage when wielded in one hand, or 1d12 when wielded with two. It can also be used to make a thrown weapon attack with a short range of 20 feet and a long range of 60 feet. The splinter immediately dissipates after it hits with a melee attack, or hits or misses with a ranged attack. Lash. The shard uncoils into a crackling whip of energy. The lash has a reach of 15 feet and deals 1d6 slashing damage on a hit. After you hit a target with your lash, you can use a bonus action to attempt to either pull them up to 10 feet directly towards you, or pull an item that they are holding into your hand. The target can resist either effect by succeeding on a strength saving throw against your spell save DC. Disc. The shard spins into a magical shield in your palm. The disc deals 1d4 bludgeoning damage. For each disc you wield, you gain a plus 1 bonus to your AC, to a maximum of plus 2. Whenever you are the target of an attack, you can use your reaction to expand one or more discs you are wielding to gain an additional plus one bonus to your AC against that attack for each disc, after which they immediately dissipate. Generally speaking, my goal here is to replace your use of offensive cantrips. When you watch the Doctor Strange movies or see sorcerers in the Avengers or other movies, they rely pretty heavily on these weapons. I think if you're going to play as this fantasy of being a Sorcerer Supreme, these should compete with Firebolt for damage dealing and usefulness. Now obviously, these aren't going to scale up the way that a cantrip would, but by making them pretty powerful, I mean it's a, it's a d10, d12 versatile weapon for the splinter, it is an incredibly long reach, slightly bumped up whip for the lash, and it's a pretty good magical shield with the disc, I think I'm keeping them relevant to use. And I think what I like about these is that you have to summon them. It's not like as part of making the attack, you just get it. You have to make that decision as a bonus action to bring them into existence. And you see the sorcerers, you see Doctor Strange do this all the time in the movies. He runs into a room, sees what the threat is, and then summons the object he needs. Speaking of which, let's go real quick to the very simple sixth level feature, extra attack. You can attack with your Fractal Shards twice, instead of once, whenever you take the attack action on your turn. This is essentially identical to, like, Thirsting Blade from Warlock. I've given you a special weapon, I've given you a way to make two attacks with it. Now this feature is maybe a little underbaked. Could I have done something more interesting? Maybe. I think probably what I would like to do is I would test this out, and if this player feels like, man, can I just have regular multi-attack because I did get this cool magic quarterstaff and I'd like to be able to make two attacks with it, then like, yeah. And maybe they'd need Bladesinger multi-attack. Maybe they're like, I want to be able to make a lash attack and pull someone towards me and then use shocking grasp on them. And like, I'm willing to admit that this probably isn't that great, but I'd probably leave it this way for first draft so that you can find out what the player wants to do. Wizards also get a 10th level feature, and for the Order of the Fractal Plane, that is Combat Topology. By 10th level, you gain the ability to open brief portals to the Fractal Plane, which allows you to control the field of battle. Whenever a creature you can see that is within 60 feet of you moves at least 5 feet, you can use your reaction to conjure a portal directly in front of them, forcing them to make a dexterity saving throw against your spell save DC. 
On a failed save, the creature is teleported to an unoccupied space you can see within 60 feet, maintaining any momentum they had when they entered. A creature can willingly fail this save, and any creature that is falling or being moved against its will automatically fails this save. You can use this ability a number of times equal to your intelligence modifier, and regain all uses when you complete a long rest. So, this is where we get into some sling ring nonsense. Now previously in this subclass, I was kind of allowing general wizard teleportation magic to stand in for the sling ring. This one is me trying to get that real Doctor Strange and Spider-Man zipping around and kicking Thanos in the head kind of energy. To do this, I kind of invented a new reaction trigger, which is when a creature you can see moves. I'm not sure that exists in the game right now, but I like the idea that you are waiting to see someone move, conjuring a portal real quick, but one that they could duck out of the way of or grab something to stop themselves. And the way it's written allows you to do it strategically with your allies. You can be like, hey, jump off the cliff you're on, and I will zip you right towards the bad guy. It doesn't do any damage inherently, and someone can willingly fail the save. So I think it uses one bit of language to both be a tool to bamboozle your enemies and to help your friends. As for the restrictions on number of uses, I chose intelligence modifier per long rest sort of at random. Like, reasonably speaking, at 10th level, a wizard's going to have 20 intelligence, so it's just going to be 5 the whole time you have this. The last feature is fractal pilgrimage. By 14th level, you have gained full access to the Fractal Plane. You add the Plane Shift spell to your spellbook if it is not there already. You always have this spell prepared, and it does not count against the number of spells you can prepare each day. You can ignore the material components of this spell if the plane being traveled to is the Fractal Plane, and can cast the spell in this way once without expending a spell slot, after which you must complete a long rest before you can do so again. In addition, if you use this spell to banish an unwilling creature to the Fractal Plane, you can bring yourself and up to six willing creatures with you, as long as they are within 10 feet of you when you cast it. So this is the capstone. I am giving you full access to the fractal plane, the thing that you've kind of been flirting with, with your other features, with the shards, with the quick little portals. Now you can just wholesale go to the fractal plane. And I'm using a pretty common design pattern that is found across D&D, which is you give a subclass access to a spell, and a special relationship to that spell, special rules when they cast it, and the ability to do it once without expending a spell slot. Now, from a game design, sort of behavioral design perspective, the key here is that by giving them the free usage, you are encouraging them to do it. It's the equivalent of getting like a gift card to a store. You know, money is money. Spell slots are spell slots. I can give you the plane shift spell, but you might not want to expend that spell slot to do plane shift. But I'm giving you a gift card to plane shift. You gotta spend it. Once a day, you should at least try, probably, to banish someone to the fractal plane because, you know, use it or lose it. Now, there is something sort of dramatically wrong with this feature that we are going to talk about in a second in the playtesting notes. Uh, guess in the comments what's wrong with it before you move on. But otherwise, plane shift, great spell. It's almost exactly how Doctor Strange moves into the mirror dimension, but he does frequently banish people and bring himself with. That's not written into plane shift as it is, so I just added that as part of his special relationship to the spell. And that's it. That's that's the order of the fractal plane. Now, uh, like I said, I have some, some things I'd be looking out for in a playtest of this. I think a big one is checking the damage numbers on the fractal shards. I pumped them up pretty high because I wanted them to compete with cantrips, and I knew that, you know, eventually at 11th level and 17th level, they're kind of going to fall off. That being said, is a level 3 wizard with this subclass kind of outperforming a fighter in combat? Because, you know, a D10, D12 versatile weapon, kind of a big deal. That is something I would definitely want to take a look at, be sensitive to. Like I said earlier, you know, I, I'd want to make a, a mid-level one and, and double-check that the extra attack is, is doing it for you. Is it necessary? Could it be a different feature? Could it be Bladesinger extra attack? Should it be Eldritch Knight spell-casting bonus action attack? That's, that's something I would really want to, like, poll players and see how they felt. But the big one, as I said, is Fractal Pilgrimage. The real problem with that feature is uh, what the hell is the fractal plane like? 
It is described in one sentence up in the flavor text. But I have given you features that encourages you to take a bad guy and your whole party into this plane, which is going to force your DM to run an encounter in the fractal plane, a thing that I invented for this subclass and has no supporting text. That is a huge problem. That is a huge problem with this subclass. I'm just going to admit it. So that's, that's probably the biggest one. But in general, that's kind of what I'd be looking for in a playtest. Those are the questions I would be asking both the players and, for the last one, uh, whoever the DM happens to be. So that is, that is it for, for episode eight. If you enjoyed this, think the subclass looks interesting, it is available now on D&D Beyond. You can click the link, you can add it to your collection, make a character. If you have any notes, thoughts about it, you know, leave it in the comments here or, or on D&D Beyond, I guess. I think there's a comment feature there. And otherwise, you know, we're going to try to knock out a full season, 13 episodes, and then we'll, uh, we'll decide what the future of this channel looks like. So, like everyone says, like, comment, subscribe, and uh, I'll see you later.